Well, hello. It's time for our Wednesday study again. We're going to be looking at the life of the Apostle Peter. This will probably be a much shorter uh, series of lessons than it was with King David. At any rate, uh, one of your advantages is that when I refer to a passage that I'm not reading, and that's going to be the case tonight, uh, you will have a chance to pause this and go look up the passage, read, read along with me, and also uh, maybe read a little bit ahead to get the full context. We're going to be talking about Peter, as I said. He's called Simon, the son of Jonah, in Matthew chapter 16. Other places, Simon, the son of Jonas. One place, Simon, the son of John. All are different forms of the same name. And uh, at any rate, in Matthew 16, Jesus is going to rename Simon to be Peter. It's called Cephas in the Aramaic, which means rock. And it's the same as the Greek form Petra or Petros, which means rock as well, which means Peter. Now, this is going to denote a change of character in a way for Peter. This is the Peter that drew his sword one moment to defend Jesus in front of an angry mob that was armed to the teeth and then later would cowardly deny that he even knew Jesus, apparently intimidated by the questions of a young servant girl. This is the apostle who would walk on water and then sink into the water. This is the apostle who would fellowship with Christians in Antioch, who were Gentiles. And then when certain brethren came up from Jerusalem sent by James, the very same Peter would withdraw from them, refusing to eat with them, refusing to associate with them. And he had to be called down by the apostle Paul because of his behavior. That back and forth type of behavior would finally solidify into a believer who would stand his ground for the name and the sake and the gospel of Christ. Now I have a confession to make regarding Peter. I remember many years ago and really for most of my life hearing sermons that every once in a while would deal with Peter. And I was told both in those sermons as well as when I went to college that Simon meant shifting sand and Jesus was renaming him Peter Rock. And that meant that God was going to change his life through Jesus and he's going to transform that shifting personality into a character that was solid as a rock. Now I accepted that definition of Simon and I repeated it in many of my lessons, even up to the last year or so. I mean, really, when you look at Peter, doesn't his behavior just say, I'm shifty? You know, I'm not solid, I'm changeable. Well, that's what I thought and that's what I taught. I would have continued teaching that for the rest of my life were it not for not very long ago. I read or heard a lesson and it talked about Simon. And it said, Simon is a word that means hearing or to hear. And I thought to myself, that can't be correct. That's not what I was taught. Uh, there's a lot of well-respected people that taught me that Simon meant shifting sand. So to prove that I'm right, I went to the bookshelf and I pulled out my trusty concordance. The Young's Analytical Concordance is a great advantage to a Bible student because next to every word that you're looking up, if you're looking up the word uh, for tabernacle or temple or even some word just to find out where it occurs, it will have the original language. It'll tell what it means. And so I picked up my Young's Analytical, which I bought about 45 years ago, and I thought, surely this book, my book, is not going to contradict my firm conviction. So I looked it up, and there, right next to the name Simon, was the word hearing. I couldn't believe it. So I went to the Hebrew form of Simon, <clears throat> the word Simeon, and I thought, well, surely, originally, this name meant shifting sand in the Hebrew. So 
I looked it up and there it was, Simeon, and it means hearing. And if that wasn't bad enough, the passage where the name Simeon first occurs is Genesis chapter 29, verse 33. Leah had given birth to Simeon. She names him Simeon because she said, the Lord has heard. How did I miss that? Uh, why, why did I take the words of others instead of investigating it myself? Well, we, we tend to accept the words of others when they are people that we respect. And why would anybody lie about something as insignificant as the meaning of the name Simon? You know, a name's not a matter of salvation, at least his name. So what does it matter really? Well, it matters because it sets a pattern, a precedent. If you and I accept without any investigation, without any checking at all on matters that are small, we will begin to accept everything from those people. And we will begin to accept anyone who stands as an authority and say, well, they must have investigated this, they must have researched this, or they wouldn't be teaching it. And so acceptance without investigation becomes a danger because eventually it will involve something that really is significant. Anyway, so much for my confession. I taught it wrongly for many years. If you heard me teach this and you told somebody else, go correct it with them, tell them it's the preacher's fault, which it is in this case. But the principle here is that this, this is something to discover for every Bible student, and it's been very important. Those that taught me that shifting sand is Simon failed me. They failed to see if what they said was true. And it would have been just as easy for them to check it as it was for me later on, which means that I'm in the same boat they were in. I taught something without checking it. So I could be criticized for the same reason. As a student of the Bible, I failed myself and I failed others. And I'm thankful that this is not a topic that will determine one's salvation, at least unless Simon's in charge of who gets into the heavenly gate. Anyway, let's get on with an actual study of Peter. Now, when we begin with Peter or Simon, John tells us in John chapter 1 that John the Baptist has several of his disciples around him and he sees Jesus passing by. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now, these two disciples that were with John began to follow Jesus. One of them was named Andrew. And we're told that what Andrew does is he first finds Simon, his brother, and brings him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus sees him, he says, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. Now, it appears that Jesus calls him by name before there's an introduction between him and Andrew. If so, that would indicate a, the divine type of knowledge that Jesus has in advance of Simon, uh, just like he does later on in that same chapter with Nathaniel. Nathaniel is called, we found the, the, we found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And he is told, come and see. So when he goes and approaches Jesus, Jesus says, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Nathaniel said, how do you know me? And Jesus said, before he called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathaniel acknowledged Jesus as the son of God. So I have a feeling that Jesus told Simon who he was, and he knew who he was, and he also gave him that indication of who he's going to become later when he first met Simon. Now, Mark chapter 1, Mark's going to give his first uh, introduction to Peter, and in his first time to mention Peter, he tells us that Andrew and Peter were by the sea. They were by their nets. They were fishermen. And Jesus called them to follow him. 
So which is the first time Jesus saw Simon? Well, apparently it's the case in John chapter 1, and later on he sees them when they are by the sea when they're fishing. Now this means that there is a progression of their relationship that we don't really see, and perhaps it's because it's not vital for us to know this, but Jesus at first has kind of an informal relationship with Andrew and with Peter and with others as well because it seems that they follow him, they listen to him, and then they go back to what they were doing in their normal lives. And after a period of time of this casual learning and part-time learning, Jesus calls them. And there's something different about this calling. This is a calling that says, uh, I want you to be a full-time disciple of mine. And we might compare this in a way to a company that hires a temporary worker, a temp. And after a bit of time, the employer watches their performance. He kind of sees their work ethics. And if he's pleased with all of that, he will say, I want to make you full-time now. You're no longer a temp. And that's sort of what happens with Jesus and these disciples. There are many disciples that followed Jesus that were never called to be apostles. And there were those that Jesus did not call to be full-time disciples during his three years of ministry. But this happens to Andrew and to Simon. And in Mark chapter 1, it's, it's an implied that there's a permanence to this invitation because they leave their nets. You know, they've been, they've been working with it. It doesn't say they put them away. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us. They say, well, let us wash them first. They left them kind of like we're not coming back to this. And right after that, in Mark chapter 1, verses 17 through 20, uh, Mark tells us that Jesus also called James and John, the sons of Zebedee, to follow him. And they left the boat. They left their father Zebedee in the boat. They left the servants that were with their father Zebedee so again, there's this permanence that's implied here that they may have listened to Jesus before. They may have been part of the crowd around Jesus, but now Jesus formally is calling them to discipleship. Now, after Jesus called these men in Mark chapter one, he goes to Capernaum and visits the synagogue there. Then he goes to Simon's home. And Simon has a mother-in-law, which means what? Simon's married, and uh, this is kind of an indication that uh, Simon Peter was never meant to be called a pope, never meant to be someone who would, you know, establish what a pope is to be, because popes do not marry, and obviously Peter did, and that the entire system is not one that I believe God in, intended to set up in the first place in the papal system. But at any rate, Simon goes to, or Simon and Jesus are in Simon's home. His mother-in-law is sick, and Jesus heals her. You know, I think there's a little lesson here for Simon and the rest of his disciples. Because to follow Jesus in the way Jesus wants them to follow him might concern them about their families and their care for their loved ones. And... Following Jesus means leaving them behind. But the message here is that Jesus is taking care of her. And they're, la they're later going to learn that Jesus can heal people from a distance. He can heal them without even ever seeing them. So there's a little bit of a confidence here that he's trying to bring into Peter's life. You can follow me, and I'm going to take care of your family. There's a little bit of a similar message in Exodus in, uh, in the book of Exodus, in chapter 34, God has instructed the Israelites that they were to go to make sacrifices to him in a very special place three times a year. Now, if you are going to have to travel somewhere, it's going to take you some time to get there, some time to get back, some time to accomplish what you're doing there, you might be a little concerned about your property, what's going to happen to the things that you leave behind. That's a natural concern that we all have. And perhaps to answer that question, God tells them in Exodus 34, verse 24, that when they are gone to make these sacrifices, he says this, no one shall covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. 
you know, that message is very clear. God's saying, I'm going to be taking care of things. No one's going to bother your things while you are doing my will. And the message from God is very, very clear for Peter and for us and for the people in Exodus. If you take care of honoring and obeying me, I will take care of you. And that's kind of the message at the end of Matthew chapter 6 and the Sermon on the Mount as well. Now I'm going to divide our study of Peter a little differently than I did with David. I tried to go chronologically with David, but we're going to be looking at Peter in kind of a different way. Uh, first of all, we're going to be, I'm going to be encouraging you to read the Gospel of Mark before our next lesson. Try to read it through in one setting if you can. And when you read it, I want you to read it with the idea of how does Mark treat Peter? How does he portray him? What part does Peter play in the Gospel of Mark? And then we're going to be talking about that uh, in a week if the Lord is willing. We're going to look at a few things here about Peter, though, first of all. In Mark chapter 5, verses 35 through 43, we have part of that story of Jairus who comes to Jesus. His 12-year-old daughter is very sick. He asks Jesus to come heal him, and while they're on the way, they're interrupted by the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years, and Jesus stops and heals her, and after he healed her, messengers come from Jairus' home and said, don't bother the teacher anymore, your daughter has died. And Jesus tells Jairus to not worry, but to only believe. Now, when they get to the house, the little girl is dead, and Jesus takes Jairus and his wife along with Peter, James, and John, and they go to where the girl is. The other of the 12 disciples have to stay outside. Only those three, Peter, James, and John, get to go in when Jesus heals this girl, raises her from the dead. Now, in Matthew chapter 17, we find a similar situation where Peter, James, and John are involved to the exclusion of the other disciples. Peter, James, and John are taken apart from the others to a high mountain. Now, this is a mountain where Jesus was transfigured before them, and in so doing, Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus, and were told elsewhere that they were discussing Jesus' impending departure from Jerusalem. Now, the disciples probably had fallen asleep or turned their heads or anything. But anyway, they look and suddenly they see these three together. And not knowing what to say, Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Uh, let's build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And that's when a cloud overshadowed shadowed them and the Lord said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. It's a very clear message that God's wanting them to start turning their focus and their attention away from the authority of Moses and turn it toward Jesus. After this event had happened, they're walking down from the mountain and Jesus tells them some question, uh, answers to their questions, but he also tells them, don't tell anyone about this vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. He gave a similar instruction after he had brought the young girl, of, uh, daughter of Jairus, to life. He told the parents not to tell anyone what had happened. So there's a very similar, there's a similarity there because of those two. And you can kind of look for yourselves to see why you think Jesus told the parents not to tell anyone but also why you think Jesus told these, these three disciples not to tell anyone until after the resurrection. Now, in Mark chapter 13, there's a third occasion where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John apart from the rest. He had been talking about the future destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Peter, James, and John talked to him privately according to Mark chapter 13. Now, Jesus gives a very detailed answer to their question about what are the signs of these things? When is this going to happen? 
And he's going to explain to them, and, and this is found also in Matthew chapter 24, where it appears like he's telling this to all the disciples. But at least for a moment, these three quietly, privately say, we want to know more about this. And either Jesus tells them all or he tells only the three, but it, this is another indication of the three of them being involved uh, with Jesus alone. And there's one last example, and that's in Mark chapter 14. Jesus and his disciples had eaten the Last Supper. They sang a hymn, they departed. They came to the Garden of Gethsemane, and when they did, Jesus told Peter, James, and John to come with him a little further into the garden. He then tells them how distressed he is. He wants them to watch and pray with him. He goes on a further away, about a stone's throw away from them, falls down to the ground. He begins to pray. He prays for an hour. He comes back to them, and they're asleep. <clears throat> this was late for them. Uh, they just couldn't keep their eyes open. He chided them for falling asleep. He went and he prayed a second time, came back, and they were asleep again. He woke them up. They didn't know what to say. He went and prayed a third time. He came back, and they were asleep again. And he said, it's enough. Uh, get up. Because at that time, the mob was approaching, along with Judas, who would betray him. Now, we don't know why Jesus picked these three, all these different times, to be the ones to see and hear things that the other disciples and the other apostles did not hear. In the first story about Jairus' daughter, they see a resurrection of the dead. In the second story, they see Moses and Elijah, who I don't know what form they existed in, if they were in bodily form. I don't know how they understood and knew who they were. Uh, for one thing, there were no pictures back in those days, but it's some, somehow they knew. And uh, it's, a, it's a transfiguration. They have a resurrection, a transfiguration. Then they have an explanation about the temple. And then at the very last time, it's a very private and, uh, and touching moment with Jesus. But on that instance, they failed Jesus very much. So Peter's one of those three that find themselves singled out by Jesus. Now, does this mean that Jesus showed favoritism? Do, do Peter, James, and John constitute what we would call a clique? You know, when we think about it, though, what Jesus does with them is, is seen a lot in life and is something that really comes naturally uh, to us. First of all, think about your own life. You probably have a fairly large group of people that you know by sight. People that you can name, you can tell, you, I know who you are. It may be a hundred people, it may be a thousand people that you can see and say, okay, I remember enough about them to call them by name. I know a little bit about them. And that's that large group. And that would be similar to the large number of disciples that followed Jesus. You remember on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, there were 120 in that upper room when the Spirit fell upon the apostles. And these were not even all that had followed Jesus during his lifetime. Then we see, secondly, there is a smaller circle of friends that we have, ones that we're, we're going to hang out with a little bit every once in a while. We might go out and have a, a meal with them. We might go to a movie with them. And we're going to have maybe uh, five, six, maybe a dozen of, uh, people that are like that, that we feel comfortable enough to invite them into our home. We know they're probably going to invite us into their homes. Well, that's very similar to Jesus and his 12 apostles. Thirdly, there's a smaller circle than that, and that's Peter, James, and John. And Jesus spends more time with them. He goes into more detail about things with them. And you have to admit, you and I, we have a small circle of people that probably occupy most of our fellowship time, most of our visiting, uh, most of our confidence uh, than, than others do. And then Jesus had one particular one that he spent the most time with or perhaps thought the most highly of, John. John called, was called the apostle whom Jesus loved. And you and I are very much like that as well because you probably have one best friend somebody that you can fight in and tell things you would not tell anyone else. So what Jesus does with his, with his disciples is, is a very common thing. 
And we see it in the world today. We see it with people and their friends. We see it with teachers and their students. We see this with, with coaches and their athletes. We see it in job training programs, many other situations. Uh, this, is, this is not a, a situation where it's a click and others are excluded. It is a situation where you and I can only concentrate on just so many people at a time. That we can only uh, have a certain closeness with just so many people at a time. Peter is one of those. When you look at Peter, he's entrusted with a lot more than most of the other disciples. And this implies that Jesus has high expectations for him and great plans for his life. Now we're going to continue our study in Peter, uh, of Peter later on next week. And in the meantime, I'll remind you, uh, try to read through the Gospel of Mark giving attention to and, and saying, I'm going to read through Mark and I'm going to see a lot of good things, but I want to remember the times when Mark talks about what Peter did and times when Mark maybe omits something about Peter that I know the other gospel writers included. It's going to be an interesting study, I hope, for everybody. And until that time, uh, be well, and we will see you again. Sunday, we're going to be worshiping again. Uh, for those that have told us they're going to be here so we can keep our numbers down to about 50 and we're going to practice our uh, social distancing. The pews are going to be every other one open. We're going to also practice wearing a mask. Now, if you did not tell the elders you were going to be here, uh, that's okay. Uh, we may open this up a little bit more the following week, but we do need to keep our numbers down. If you did not tell us you're going to be here, uh, enjoy the sermon online. If you did tell us you're going to be here, we look forward to seeing you. We're not judging anyone who can't make it, feels like they, they shouldn't make it, and uh, we understand that very much. But at the time, we are limited in what we can do, and we hope you understand that. Uh, God bless you, and we'll see you next time.